Hello, I am Dr. Upasana Bora. At the very outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity. And today I'll be talking on the normal zone anatomy and scanning protocol of the knee joint. We all know that knee is a bicondylar synovial hinge joint that is capable of flexion extension movement mainly and also rotation and side to side movement to some extent. Like any other synovial joint, it has articular cartilage covering the articular surface and also a thick fibrous capsule and has important structures like menisci and the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments which are intracapsular but extrasynovial and medial and lateral collateral ligament and all these structures have their own crucial roles to play. And also reminding many important bursae and uh, the recesses around the knee joint, we will move into the ultrasound screening of the knee joint. Starting with the anterior knee, the patient is supinely flexed at 30 to 40 degree. Put a pillow below the knee joint to make the patient comfortable. And we are going to see the following structures one by one. So here we are going to see the quadriceps muscle forming the quadriceps tendon the patella and the prepatellar area, the patellar tendon, retinaculum, suprapatellar recess, and the prepatellar and infrapatellar bursae. So in the thigh, the rectus femoris being the most superficial structure, and the vastus lateralis and medialis are the intermediate layer, and the deepest layer is formed by the vastus intermediate. So as we move down, we can see the muscle fibers getting thinner and they are opposed and ultimately diffuse to form the quadriceps tendon about one centimeter above the patella. In long axis, we can demonstrate the trilaminar structure of the quadriceps tendon nicely. And the tendon fibers appear hypoechoic because of its oblique orientations and the anisotropy with the intervening hyperechoic loose areolar tissue layers that allow some gliding movement between the tendon fibers. Underlying this, we have suprapatellar fat bed and prefemoral fat bed, which are well defined and a little bit compressible. And in between them, we have the supraspine suprapatellar uh, recess, which is an important part because we have to check there for the joint diffusion, synovial thickening or loose bodies, etc. And even in cross section, we can demonstrate the trilaminar pattern of the quadriceps tendon very nicely. Retinacula are demonstrable as bilaminar fibrous seat on either side of the patella in posterior oblique orientations and they are inseparable from the underlying capsules and ligaments. They act as a stabilizer and hold the patella and prevent its lateral translocation. The most cranial fibers of the medial retinaculum, they are thickened and blend with the medial patellofemoral ligament that passes from the patella supramedially to get inserted into the femur between the medial epicondyle and the adductor tubercle. In the prepatellar region, we used a floating technique. That is, we put a lot of gel over the patella and uh, put the probe very lightly over it to avoid any compression so that we can visualize the superficial fibers from the rectus femoris crossing over the patella and uh, joining the patellar tendon below. Also have a note in this area for the prepatellar bursa, which is usually not seen there in ultrasound normally if it is not inflamed and distended. Sliding the probe into the infrapatellar region, you can see the patellar tendon arising from the inferior pole of the patella, crossing over the hofer's pad pad and the tibial epiphysis and inserting into the tibial diversity. Joining the patella and the tibial tuberosity, we will have the nice prevalent pattern of uh, patella tendon, which is about 3 to 5 mm thick, and it overlays the whole first fat pad here, and it has clinical implication associated with the patella tendonopathy. 
we should look for prepatellar and superficial infrapatellar bursa here and usually in normal cases we don't see any fluid there but we may have deep infrapatellar bursa in this area and it may show some fluid in normal ultrasound also. Must scan through the wide transverse axis of the patellar tendon throughout the length and the width that shows a nice brass and on appearance to rule out any focal pathology. Knee fully flexed, putting the probe in slight posterior oblique orientation, we can see the smooth and echoic homogeneous layer of trochlear articular cartilage that follows the contour of the trochlea. And even we can measure the trochlear sulcal angle if it is more than 155 degree, it suggests trochlear dysplasia, and that can result in patellofemoral instability. Keeping the probe over the tibial tuberosity and rotating the cranial land towards the lateral femoral condyle, you can visualize only the superficial part of the anterior cruciate ligament there. Keeping the knee extended, we can push the patella from its superior aspect inframedially and you can scan there to see part of the retropatellar cartilage on medial side, but uh, remember the lateral part is not accessible as it is covered by the prominent trochlea. So we can have a uh, good idea about the extensional system of the knee sweeping along the anterior aspect of the knee joint. Next, we'll move into the medial compartment. On the medial aspect, we are going to see the medial meniscus and medial joint line. The deep component of the medial collateral ligament, which is fused posteriorly with the posterior oblique ligament and is overlaid by the superficial medial collateral ligament. We have MPFL there as we already seen in the anterior compartment. And of course, we have to see the patient's you know, renus tendons and the patient's renus basa there. And the knee will be flexed at 20 to 30 degree uh, with the leg and hip externally rotated during examination. Putting the probe in long axis over the joint anteromedially, we can see the medial joint line and uh, with the two articular surfaces of the tibia and femur, which is covered by the articular cartilage, and the medial meniscus uh, superficial part as a small triangular area there. But remember, uh, the visualization of this structure in ultrasound is always inadequate and partial. On the medial aspect from superficial to deep, we have the superficial MCL, deep MCL, which uh, blends with the medial meniscus which appears as a triangular ecosonic structures lying between the articular surfaces of the femur and the tibia which are covered by articular cartilages. So the deep MCL is actually a thickened capsular ligament and it underlies the superficial MCL and fused with the meniscus and it has a 15 millimeter long menisco femoral component and a 5 mm long meniscotibial component that fused with the superficial MCL distally. Superficial MCL is about 2 to 3 mm thick and 9.5 cm long. It arises just below the medial epicondyle and at, the, at this side it is much thicker and wider and needs a detailed evaluation because most of the pathologies including tears are most common in this region. So as you move down we can see the ligament passing across the joint line moving down into the proximal tibia to get this insertion about 6 to 7 cm below the joint line. Lying between the distal MCL and the anterior tibial concavity, we have the medial genicular artery and nerve. And that actually serves as an important landmark to identify the base and serenous uh, tendons that lies anterior to the uh, MCL. And they, they are actually intermingling fiber of the sartreus 
gracilis and semitendinosus getting insertion just anterior to the MCL into the proximal tibia. And we have pair sensoriness passa there in between the bone and the tendons. And uh, it's usually not seen in ultrasound unless it get inflamed with uh, some infection or inflammation. We can't perform valgus stress test to see the intactness of MCL. The knee should be bent at 30 degree and the valgus trace is applied. Uh, and if there is opening more than 5 mm compared to the other knee, then it's significant. After medial knee, we'll move to the lateral knee and we'll examine the knee at 20 to 30 degree flexion. Leg is internally rotated. On the lateral side, we are going to see the lateral joint line, the iliotibial tract, lateral collateral ligament, bicep femoris tendon, and the popliteus tendon. Placing the probe on the anterolateral aspect of the knee in long axis, we can see the articular surface of femur and tibia, which are covered by the articular cartilage, the superficial triangular portion of the lateral meniscus, and above this, this is the popliteal fossa, which is occupied by the uh, popliteus tendon that you can see in cross section. Inserting into the Gardis tubercle where it fans out, the lutebial tract can be seen as a thin fibrous band and it lies between the anterior and middle third of the lateral leg and is oriented along the major axis of the thigh. Next, we'll scan it in short axis. In fact, we should make it a habit to scan all the structures in short axis along their anterior length. Now to examine the posterior lateral structure of the knee joint inserting into the fibular head, we have to identify the fibular head either by palpation or we have to move across the tibia into the posterior lateral aspect to find out the bony cortical margin of the fibular head. Now keeping the caudal edge of the probe over the fibular head, rotate the cranial and anteriorly with probe orientation along the leg, we can visualize the lateral collateral ligament as a thin cylindrical cord-like structure joining the lateral femoral epicondyle to the fibular head. And here we can see the conjoint tendon uh, at the distal end of the LCL and it is wrapped around by the bicep femoris tendon very nicely in this picture. Keeping the caudal end of the probe fixed over the fibular head. Now we rotate the cranial end posteriorly along the axis of the thigh and we are able to see the bicep tendon inserting into the fibular head. As we move up, we can see the caudally extended muscle fibers from the short head of the bicep muscle inserting into the tendon. And this muscle fiber also help us to identify the tendon. For the posterior knee, patients will lie prone, knee extended, and we start the examination from the lower thigh level. Finally, moving to the posterior knee, the important structures we are going to see are the popliteus muscle, plantaris muscle, soleus, biceps humoris, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, lateral and medial head of gastrocnemius, the popliteal fossa with the neurovascular bundle there, and of course, the semimembranosus gastrocnemius passa or the Morenbecker cyst. Screening down on the medial aspect of the thigh, you can see the muscle fibers of the semitendinosus and semimembranosus progressing towards their myotonous junction and ultimately forming their own respective tendons there. And on the lateral aspect, we can see the medial head of gastrocnemius arising with its typical eccentric location of its tendon. And between the semimembranosus and gastrocnemius tendon, we have the semimembranosus gastrocnemius passa or the morenbecosis. And it is important to show the pedicle joining into the cavity. And on the medial aspect, we have semitendinosus, sartorius, and gracilis muscle that forms the best anterior complex and passes into the anteromedial aspect of the knee. 
uh, toolkit insertion there. Now the semi-membranous passes distally to get inserted into the into a fossa on the posterior tibial epiphysis with a medial head of gastrocnemius crossing it by its side to get its proximal insertion into the medial condyle of femur. Plantaris muscle can be identified in the short axis view that appears between the two head of gastrocnemius as a triangular muscle belly and it becomes more prominent as it moves upwards to, the, uh, to its insertion site into the supracondylar reach of femur. Popliteus muscle form the base of the popliteus fossa and it can be identified underlying the popliteal vessels in long axis and also we can demonstrate its insertion into the popliteal fossa. The popliteal neurovascular bundle can be better demonstrated in short axis view on the posterolateral aspect of the knee and we can demonstrate the posterior tibial nerve, the popliteal vein and the popliteal artery from the superficial to the deeper aspect. Short axis view in the mid popliteal region shows the intercondylar fossa and in case of SL tear, there may be some bleeding or hematoma that we have to look for. Keeping the caudal aspect of the probe over the tibial epiphysis, we will rotate the cranial end of the probe towards the medial epicondyle in a sagittal oblique position. Then you can see the distal two-third of the posterior cruciate ligament that appears as a thick hypoechoic cord-like structure with a bucket handle appearance. Another common structure that we ask to see is the common peritoneal nerve on the posterior lateral aspect of the knee joint. And we can demonstrate it nicely with little bit of practice. So after origin from the sciatic nerve, CPN passes distally along the posterior medial aspect of the bicep femoris muscle, then through a restricted space between the bone and the fossa at the fibular head level. Then it winds around the fibular neck, deep to the attachment of the peroneus longus muscle. And here it divides into the superficial and deep peroneal nerve. And lastly, we should have a look into the proximal tibio fibular joint and of course the insertion of the lateral head of gastrocnemius into the lateral condyle of femur that may contain a sesamoid bone which is called a favela and it acts as a stabilizer to the soft tissue structures on the posterior lateral aspect of the knee. So that concludes our knee examination and in conclusion, I would like to say that every diagnostic tool has some advantages and some limitations and, and we should know our limitations because limitation inspire innovation and there is always a key to success and in MSK ultrasound good anatomical knowledge, a proper protocol and practice give us that key to success. Thank you so much.